Section 36 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Ivey. Chapter 23. Cases rated at AIIQ 190 to 200. John Stuart Mill. 1806 to 1873, a celebrated English philosophical writer, logician, and economist. AIIQ 190, AIIIQ 170. 1. Family standing. Mill's paternal grandfather was a shoemaker. His father, James Mill, the utilitarian philosopher, author of a standard history of India, in addition to philosophical works, was for 17 years a member of the East India House, and for the last six of these, chief examiner. Mill's mother was the daughter of a widow who managed a lunatic asylum, started by her husband. James Mill seems to have looked down upon his wife. 2. Development age 17. 1. Interests. John Stuart Mill had no childhood. His interests and his activities were mature from the first. In his early years, he was not allowed to associate with the children of his own age. Because his attention was directed exclusively to abstractions, he was inattentive and unobservant in matters of daily life. Brought up an agnostic and a questioner, his one concern was always the search for fundamental truth. At fifteen, on reading the works of Bentham, Mill reached a turning point in his intellectual life. The rational materialist became, at that time, an outspoken champion of democracy and a determined reformer of existing world conditions. 2. Education. Until he was fourteen, Mill was educated at home by his father. He began to learn Greek at three, and from then to his ninth year he studied Greek classics, making daily reports of his reading. At the same time, under his father's direction, he read innumerable historical works. At seven he read Plato, at eight he began the study of Latin. Before the end of the year he was busily reading the classical Latin writers. He did not neglect mathematics. At eight his course included geometry and algebra. At nine, conic sections, spherics, and Newton's arithmetic were added. In the latter, he performed all the problems without the book, and most of them without any help from the book. At ten and eleven, both mathematical and classical studies were continued. Astronomy and mechanical philosophy were also included. Inflections began at eleven. Mill was slightly self-taught. One part of his course, the writing of English verse, he heartily disliked. At the age of twelve, philosophy and logic, including argumentation, became important parts of the program. Daily debate with his father, who taught him above all things to accept no opinion unchallenged, was a most stimulating exercise. At thirteen, a complete course in political economy was undertaken with intensive supplementary reading. Young Mill attended also a course of lecturers on chemistry at the Royal Military College. In spite of the wide variety of subjects and the early age at which he started to study them, Mill's education was not one of cram. Complete understanding was made to proceed, or at least to accompany every forward step. Self-conceit of a sort was guarded against, for the boy never heard himself praised. Moreover, he had one with whom to compare himself except his father, and this comparison was always humbling to his own pretensions. His father's frequent request for the definition of words used accentuated young Mill's sense of ignorance. At fourteen, John visited France as a guest of General Sir Samuel Bentham, and there spent his days in study, reading, driving, sightseeing, swimming, in learning to sing, dance, fence and ride, and occasionally in collecting plants and insects. The plan of study was both intensive and extensive, including, as it did, continuation of the studies already begun, as well as vast amounts of reading, especially in French literature. Nine hours were daily devoted to hard intellectual labour, requiring intensive application. On the recommendation of the Benthams, and of a distinguished French chemist, Mill was allowed to remain in France through the winter to attend lectures at Montpellier University. These included chemistry, zoology, metaphysics and logic. Mathematics he continued under a private tutor. The most important result of Mill's study in France was the sympathetic acquaintance which he gained there with French modes of thought and action. The following years, his 16th and 17th, were spent at home in the study of philosophy, history, psychology, and in literary composition. At 16, Mill began the study of law with John Austin.
3. School standing and progress. C. 2. 2. 4. Friends and associates. Until Mill was 14, his associates were the members of his family, chiefly his father and his father's friends. He was treated as an intellectual equal by men of high ability and attainment, even in his early years. In France, he was associated with the distinguished family of General Bentham and their friends. On his return, he was much with Grote and John Austin, both of whom influenced him profoundly. At 16, Mill became acquainted with Charles Austin, the first real friend who was almost a contemporary. On a visit to Cambridge at 16, Mill made an unusual impression upon a number of undergraduates by his great conversational power, although the students he met were acquainted with Macaulay and Austin. 5. Reading Mill read Greek and history from his fourth year onward, Plato at seven. Thucydides, Anacreon, Sophocles, Euripides, Demosthenes, Aristophanes, and Cicero at eight. The Odyssey, Theocritus, Pindar, Aeschines, and Livy at nine, and progressively more difficult classical writers from ten onward. Keel's Astronomy and Roberts's Mechanical Philosophy, his special delight, Universal history in English literature, especially Shakespeare, Dryden, and Scott. Scientific treatises in chemistry and physics were special favourites. At 14, the French writers made up a large share of the reading programme. At 15 and 16, the works of Condillac, Dumont, Bentham, Blackstone, Locke, Helvidius, and the Scottish philosophers were added. Also a history of the French Revolution and an analysis of the influence of natural religion. The careful study to which many of these books were subjected is indicated by close marginal notes. 6. Production and Achievement A history of Rome written at six and a half is an extraordinary production for so young a lad. Letters written at eight show an excellent style and precocious interests. A synoptic table of Aristotle's rhetoric was made by Mill at eleven, and during the same year he prepared a number of histories, verses, and metrical translations. Before he was twelve, he had begun to assist his father in correcting the proof of the history of India. From twelve to fourteen, he prepared notes from his father's discourses to him during their walks together, and these became the base of James Mill's elements of political economy. At thirteen and fourteen, John made complete analysis of some of the orations of Demosthenes. At fifteen and sixteen, he instructed his younger brother and sisters in the subjects his father had taught him. At sixteen, he wrote his first argumentative essay and this was followed by a number of others on various topics. Two letters in defence of his father's economic views were printed, before their author was seventeen, in The Traveller, a newspaper owned by an opponent and edited by a friend of James Mill. With the support of a group of young men of ability and independent thought, young Mill organised, before he was eighteen, the Utilitarian Society. He was even then the leader of the group, and from that time he had considerable influence on their mental progress. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2, 2 and 5 At the age of 5, Mill discussed the comparative merits of Marlborough and Wellington with the Lady Spencer, the wife of the First Lord of the Admiralty. The boy's distinctive ability was early recognised by critical observers, and writing of him at 14, his father's friend Bain sums up his achievement as follows. If I were to compare him with the most intellectual youth that I have ever known, or heard or read of, I should say that his attainments on the whole are not unparalleled, though I admit very rare. His classical knowledge, such as it is, might be forced upon a clever youth of that age. The mathematics could not be so easily commanded. But the one thing in my judgment, where Mill was most markedly in advance of his use, was logic. It was not merely that he had read treatises on the formal logic, as well as Rob's Computatio Siv Logica but that he was able to chop logic with his father in regard to the foundations and demonstrations of geometry. I have never known a similar case of precocity. We must remember, however, that while his father could not be expected to teach him everything, yet in point of fact there were a few things that he could and did teach effectively. One of these was logic. The others were political economy, historical philosophy and politics, all of which were eminently his own subjects. On these, John was a truly precocious youth. His innate aptitudes, which must have been great, received the utmost stimulation that it was possible to apply. AI IQ 190, relative coach of data, point eight two. Three, Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Mill entered the service of the East India Company, with whom he remained until he was 52. 
During his first year of service, he made many journalistic contributions, and the following year he wrote for the newly founded Westminster Review. His articles have been chiefly book reviews on history, politics, or political economy, or discussions on special political topics. His friendship with Roebuck began at this time. In 19, he commenced editing Bentham's work on evidence and enormous labour, entertaining not only selection and revision of the author's material, but the addition of suitable supplementary discussions from other writers. In this year, Mills started the Parliamentary History and Review, attended debates and readings, the latter field of activity covering the works of his father, Ricardo and Hobbes. In the following year, he continued his debates and readings, and his book reviews for the Westminster. At this time, the first signs appeared of an approaching mental crisis. He fell into a state of nervous depression during which he felt that his tasks were carried on quite mechanically. At twenty, his outward life followed the same course. Debates, reviews, readings and discussions. The subject logic. At twenty-two appeared his last article for the Westminster, one on Scott's life of Napoleon. He was promoted assistant examiner at the East India Company, and he commenced his friendship with Maurice and Sterling. During the next year, the subject of the discussions was the analysis of the human mind. At 24, excited by the revolution, Mill visited Paris and there became acquainted with the French philosophy of history. On his return to England, he prepared a series of articles on French politics which soon appeared in various reviews. He began to outline his ideas on, on the logical distinction between terms, a study which developed in the next year. Mill's 26, to logical axioms and a theory of syllogisms. He continued his articles on the spirit of the age and published them in The Examiner. In this year, he first met his future wife. It is noteworthy that Mill did not read Wordsworth until his 22nd year, and that he was then surprised to find that the poet belonged to him, as well as to others. AIIQ 170, Relative Coastal Data, point eight two. End of section 36. Section 37 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 24. Case Studies of Group B. Part 1. Robert Fulton, 1765-1815. An American engineer and inventor. BIIQ 105, BIIIQ 115. 1. Family Standing. Fulton's father was probably of Irish descent. For many years he held offices of public trust in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Later he turned to farming, but without bettering his financial status. He died when his son was three years old. The mother appears to have been a woman of superior attainments. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Of Robert's early interests, it is reported that he was ingenious in mechanical experiments, and that, like his older fellow townsman, Benjamin West, he displayed a taste for painting. This taste, however, he found it hard to gratify during the revolutionary period as materials were difficult to obtain, and sympathy for such a pastime was wanting. See also 2.6. 2. Education. Until he was seven years old, Robert was taught at home by his mother. Thereafter, he attended the school of one Caleb Johnson, a Quaker and a Tory. 3. School standing and progress. Robert did not distinguish himself at school. 4. Friends and associates. When about 14 years of age, he became acquainted with the mechanician's young apprentice, who was four years his senior. Of his other associates, there is no specific record. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and Achievement Robert's early mechanical achievements were various. He powdered out lead for a pencil, performed experiments with quicksilver, which, however, he was unwilling to describe, drew designs for firearms, and became expert in determining the carrying distance of different bores and balls. When he was about 13, he manufactured an air gun. Of his success, however, there is no record. Before he was 15, he manufactured a small working model of a fishing boat to be propelled by paddles, a set of paddle wheels operated by double crank motion, which were actually used on a fishing boat, are also attributed to his workmanship. 
7. Evidence of precocity, C26. BIIQ 105, relative quotient data, 0.11. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Fulton left his home in Lancaster and established himself in Philadelphia. Willing to undertake any available employment, he obtained orders for machinery and carriage designs and executed a number of paintings, miniatures still extant. By the age of 20, he had met with some success in his painting. At 21, he left Philadelphia and sailed for England and there won the patronage of Benjamin West probably working under the supervision of the elder artist. At the age of 25, Fulton exhibited two portraits in the Royal Academy and four others in the collection of the Royal Society of British Artists. His work was favourably noticed, and financial as well as artistic success was in sight. BIIQ 115, relative quotient of data, 0 0.20. Mrs. Gaskill, Elizabeth Clogorn Stevenson, 1810-1865. An English novelist and biographer. BIIQ 110, BIIIQ 115. 1. Family Standing. Mrs. Gaskill's father was at various times a Unitarian minister, a farmer, a boarding house keeper for university students, an editor for Scots Magazine, a contributor to the Edinburgh Review, and a keeper of the records of the Treasury. Her mother, who died soon after her daughter's birth, was a member of a family of great account in Cheshire. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. From 14 to 16, Elizabeth attended a boarding school at Stratford on Avon, where she was taught Latin, French, and Italian. At 16 or 17, she made several visits to London. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates. No record has been found of others than relatives and school associates. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No record. BIIQ 110. Relative coast of data. 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Between the ages of 17 and 21, Elizabeth spent two winters at Newcastle on Tyne and a season at Edinburgh. The visits of the latter city furnished material for the introduction to Round the Sofa. According to latter family tradition, Elizabeth had written a short story before her marriage at the age of 21. Through the interest in social problems of William Gaskill, Unitarian Minister of Manchester, who became her husband, the young author found an opportunity to observe the labour conflicts of the cities, and this experience afforded material for her letter writings. BIIIQ 115, Letter of Coach of Data, point one one. Philip H. Sheridan, 1831-1888, an American general. BIIQ 110, BIIIQ 125. 1. Family Standing Sheridan's father, originally an Irish farmer, became a contractor in America, but after suffering financial reverses, returned to farming, although he remained in the country of his adoption. The mother, who was also a second cousin of the father, was said to possess excellent common sense and clear discernment, which in every way fitted her for her maternal duties. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Sheridan's sole wish was to become a soldier and his highest aspiration to go to West Point. 2. Education After receiving his earliest training under the guidance of his mother, he was sent, when old enough, to the village school, where he acquired a smattering of geography, history, arithmetic and grammar. 3. School standing and progress Sheridan was not unlike many other boys, for he played truant many a time. 4. Friends and associates No specific information. See 2-3 5. Reading. Between the ages of 15 and 17, Sheridan read so much and to such good advantage that he became a local authority in history. 6. Production and Achievement. When about 14 years of age, Sheridan went to work in a grocery store. At 15, he was engaged by a competitor of his first employer. And before the year was out, he became bookkeeper in the dry goods store of the most enterprising man in the village at a salary five times that received in his first employment. 7. Evidences of Precocity, No Record, BIIQ 110, Relative Coach Data, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26 At 17, Sheridan entered West Point, having, after zealous preparatory study, secured an appointment on his own initiative. His scholarship improved steadily from one term's examination to another, but at the age of 20 he was suspended for fighting a duel. 
because the offender's previous good conduct, the sentence imposed in this case was a light one. At 22, Sheridan graduated at 34th in a class of 52, and the same year he was commissioned a brevet second lieutenant in the U.S. Infantry. At 23, he was promoted to a second lieutenancy. At 24, he was placed as the only officer in charge of 300 recruits, and during the same year, for services in subduing the Yakima Indians. He was specially mentioned for his gallantry, in General Scott's report from Army Headquarters in New York. During his years of service, Sheridan continued his self-instruction, chiefly in subjects connected with his profession. BIIIQ 125, Relative Coast of Data, point six zero. Hans Christian Andersen, 1805-1875, a Danish novelist and poet, writer of fairy tales and travels. BIIQ 115, BIIIQ 125. 1. Family Standing Hans Christian's great-grandmother, a member of a noble family, ran away from home to marry beneath her social status. The poet's father was a poor shoemaker of delicate health, endowed with a poetical nature, a fondness for reading, and a liberal religious faith. He desired more than all else, the education and advancement of his son. The poet's mother was sensitive, gentle, and religious. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Hans Christian's earliest recollections were of Sunday walks in the woods with his father. At the age of three, he was much impressed by the sight of Spanish soldiers, and at six, the coming of the big comet aroused his superstitious delight. During his childhood, he took little interest in boys' games at school, but remained sitting within doors, where his greatest pleasure was in making clothes for the dolls of his puppet show, or in gazing at imagined scenes among the sun-illuminated leaves. He early expressed a desire to go upon the stage, but his mother opposed his wish, urging him to become a tailor. 2. Education An old woman who had an ABC school taught Hans Christian's letters, to spell and to read write. Later the lad attended a boys' school. From his 13th to his 14th year, he was enrolled in a charity school, where he received instruction in religion, writing and arithmetic. At this time, he was also prepared for confirmation by the provost. 3. School standing in progress One day at the ABC school, having got a hit of the rod, I rose immediately, took my book, and without further ceremony went home to my mother, asked that I might go to another school, and that was granted me. At the new school, the little fellow became a favourite of the teacher, who petted him in various ways. Later, at the charity school, the lad appears to have done poor work in arithmetic, but he must have shown ability in some subjects, for his mother, boasting of his good memory, said, Hans Christian does not need to open his book, as yet he knows his lesson. 4. Friends and Associates Hans Christian's associates were his parents, the neighbours, and his school companions. Among the latter was a little girl, the only one in tenants at the boys' school who became a devoted comrade. She remained his confidante until the youthful poet's imagination carried him beyond her practical comprehension, and she cried out, He is a fool like his grandfather. See also 2.6. 5. Reading Hans Christian's father had read Holberg's plays aloud to his son, and after the father's death, the boy, aged 11, continued alone the reading his father had begun, adding to Holberg's dramas the plays of Shakespeare. More general works, from a circulating library, were available in the home of friends. In Copenhagen, Hans Christian, aged 16, bought old playbooks with his small earnings, and he read voluminously in the university library. 6. Production and Achievement At 11, or a little later, and during the period of his greatest interest in his puppet theatre, Hans Christian began to write little plays. The first of these, a tragedy borrowed from the old song of Paramus and Thisbe, was read aloud to all the neighbours by its author to his own great satisfaction and joy. Hans Christian was much surprised and depressed when one of his bearers ridiculed his production. After being comforted by his mother, he began a second piece in which a king and a queen were among the characters. To their majesties, in order to emphasise their rank, he gave speeches peppered with English, French and German words. This play also he was pleased to read aloud. In a factory where the lad was at this time employed, the older workmen performed his duties so that he might spend his time singing and acting for them. The boy was happy in these surroundings until a rude jibe from a fellow worker caused him to leave his job and the premises. At about the same time, the boy gave expression to another phase 
in artistry by making a beautiful white pincushion for an aristocratic lady whom he admired. At the age of 13, Hans Christian acted minor parts with the Royal Theatre Company in his native village, and at 14, sure of a successful future on the stage, he journeyed to Copenhagen, armed with a letter of introduction to a well-known dancer. After many discouragements in the city, he finally won the patronage of distinguished men. Through their kindness, he received instruction in singing and in dancing at the Royal Theatre. His joy was boundless when at length he was given a few small parts to act. During this time, he tried his hand at writing, but met with no success. 7. Evidences of Precocity When still quite small, Hans Christian was a welcome guest in the spinning room of the poorhouse, and there on one occasion he delivered an illustrated lecture on anatomy to the inmates, an effort that greatly impressed his elderly and decrepit audience. In his early years, he was considered a strange, clever child who would not live long. His imagination was stimulated by the fairy stories he was told at the poorhouse and by the sights he had seen in the neighbouring insane hospital. Once when gleaning with others in a forbidden harvest field, he won the interest and patronage of the bailiff, who would have struck the little trespasser by exclaiming, How dare you strike me when God can see it? The strong, stern man looked at him, patted him on the cheeks, asked his name and gave him money. Hans Christian's mother was led by this and other episodes to regard her son as an unusual child, but among the boys he was derided as the playwriter. He would study the list of persons in plays and think out a whole comedy for himself. Often alone at home, for his mother went out to work, he occupied himself with his little puppet theatre, with the puppets and with their parts. Several influential families in the town nearby became interested in Hans Christian and invited him to visit them. In the aristocratic houses he met, among others, Prince Christian, afterward King of Denmark. BIIQ 115, relative coast of data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Anderson's first published work, a volume of miserable poems, appeared when its writer was 17. From his 18th to his 23rd year, he attended school as a ward of the king. Although discouraged and unhappy, he seems to have done fairly well, for at 22 he was able to enter the university. At 23 he had written and published a journey on foot from the Holm Canal to the east point of Amak, as well as a volume of minor works. The young author was much elated by praise and hurt by blame of his writings, for then, as always, he was sensitive and sentimental. Before he was 24, Anderson had passed his second academic examination with high honours. At 25, he made a long journey through his native country, the remembrance of which re-echoes in later works. BIIIQ 125, Relative Coach of Data, 0 0.60 William Lloyd Garrison, 1805-1879, an American abolitionist. BIIQ 115, BIIIQ 130. 1. Family Stunning Garrison's father, a sea captain, was remembered by his contemporaries as a smart man, bright at most everything. Although possessing qualities that led to his being described as genial, social and affectionate, he deserted his family when his son, William Lloyd, was three years old. The son wrote of his mother, her mind was one of the first order, clear, vigorous, creative and lustrous, and sanctioned by an ever-glowing piety. She was mirthed as well and had a sense of the humorous. 2. Development to age 17 one interests. As a little boy, William Lloyd enjoyed games and sports such as hoops, swimming, skating, boating and snowballing, and marbles. When he was about 14, he wished to be apprenticed in a trade because, to quote his mother, he could then go to work and help maintain his mother. A very good resolve for a child of 14. Garrison became interested in politics at an early age. He gave ardent support to the Federalist Party at a time when party feeling ran high in the state. 2. Education after receiving his first training at the primary or writing school, he was sent away from home for three months, at the age of six, to attend grammar school. At the close of this brief session, it was necessary for him to leave school to help earn the family living. At ten, he so longed to return to school that he was sent back to the grammar school in Newburyport, where he remained until he was eleven. 3. School Standing in Progress In his earlier school days, Garrison was slow in mastering the alphabet, and so was surpassed even by his little sister, two and one-half years his junior. 
left-handedness which the master insisted he must overcome increased his difficulties but finally and in spite of all he attained a good penmanship toward the end of his schooling in newburyport his mother wrote expressing her pleasure in his good behaviour and his improvement in school four friends and associates no record five reading william early evinced a taste for poetry he was fond of fiction and romance six production and achievement at six or before he began his business career selling molasses candy on election and training days between six and nine his singing voice was remarkable for its beauty and he sometimes acted as chorister in the baptist church when nine years old he was apprenticed to a quaker shoemaker and learned in a few months to make a tolerable shoe a period of schooling was followed by an apprenticeship to a cabinet maker by the end of six weeks aged about twelve he could make a toy bureau and help with veneering but he was so homesick that he ran away at only the age of thirteen, he was apprenticed to the printer of the new Berryport Herald. He soon learned the printing trade, finding it a positive recreation. He quickly grew expert and accurate as a compositor, and greatly pleased the editor by his superior performance. At sixteen and a half, his first published work appeared, a discussion, The Breach of the Marriage Promise, of the signature An Old Bachelor. A second communication in similar vein followed in three days, and a highly imaginative account of a shipwreck within a week. A little later, the young journalist contributed two articles on South American affairs. 7. Evidences of Precocity. C2, 1 and 6. BIIQ 115, relative kosher data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 20, Garrison completed his apprenticeship with the Herald, and left his post with a considerable record of published political and literary articles. From 20 to 25, he edited various papers, making his personality felt wherever he wrote. He was 22 when a visit from Lundy, anti-slavery advocate, determined him to devote his life to philanthropy and reform. A year later, he and his new friend entered into close cooperation when Garrison became editor of the Census of Universal Emancipation. At 24, Garrison was convicted of Lobel for publications upon the slave trade and imprisoned. At 25, he established the Liberator, whose policy was to demand immediate emancipation. BIIIQ 130, relative coach of data 0 0.60. George William Frederick Villiers, 4th Earl of Clarendon, 1800 to 1870, an English statesman and diplomatist. BIIQ 120, BIIIQ 125. 1. Family standing. Villiers' ancestors were men of high political standing. His paternal grandfather served with distinction as English minister in Germany and was the first Earl of Clarendon. The father does not appear to have displayed any commanding or endearing qualities. He held various civil service appointments. The mother, a woman of great energy, admirable good sense and high feeling, was the only daughter of the first Lord Borringdon and a descendant of Cromwell. 2. Development towards 17. 1. Interests. Letters written from college... Villiers entered at sixteen, indicate their writer's interest in horses, dogs, and late dinners. They contain also vivid discussions of current events. The young student had a distaste for logic and an incapacity for mathematics, but a strong turn for languages. 2. Education. Nothing is known of Villiers' school days except that he received private instruction from the Masters of Christ's Hospital School. At sixteen, he entered St. John's College, Cambridge, where, by his father's arrangement, he prepared for lectures by reading with a private tutor. 3. School standing and progress. C2-1. 4. Friends and associates. Villiers was much attached to his beloved sister, the Reza, and during his college years carried on a voluminous correspondence with her. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. No record. 7. Evidence of precocity. At the age of 9 months, he cut his first tooth. BIIQ Washington 20. Relief kosher data. 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. In accordance with an ancient university privilege awarded to descendants of royalty and members of the higher aristocracy, Villiers, aged 20, was admitted to the degree of M.A. without the preliminary B.A. Through family influence, he became attached a little later to the embassy of Sir Charles Bagot at St. Petersburg. At 23, and through the same influence, he was given a seat on the Board of Customs, where he rapidly attained popularity. B.I.I.I.Q. was 25, relative coach of data, 0.20. 
Ludwig Holberg, 1684-1754, the father of Danish drama and the greatest name in Danish literature. BIIQ 120, BIIQ 135. One family standing. Holberg's father was a first lieutenant who had risen from the ranks, an advance by no means easy or usual in his day. The mother, a woman of keen intelligence, was the granddaughter of a bishop. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. C. 2. 2. 2. Education. After the death of his parents, Ludwig was taken into the home of an uncle who sent him, at the age of 10, to a Latin school in preparation for the profession of arms. His education was interrupted soon after, when he was adopted by a cousin, but later resumed because of his own keen desire. Again with his uncle, the boy continued in attendance at the Latin school until he was 18. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, C22. BIIQ 120, relative coast of data, point two zero. Development from 17 to 26. Holdwork entered the University of Copenhagen at 18, interrupted his studies for a short period of tutoring, and then returning, received his university degree at the age of 20. He worked hard at French, English, and Italian, and obtained honours in theology, but found scholastic philosophy distasteful. A period of travel and tutoring followed. In the course of his journeys, he came to Oxford, where the great libraries first aroused in him the wish to be an author, and to Hale, where he met the German philosopher Thomasius, whose influence is noticeable in his early work. At 25, the youth returned to Copenhagen, where he remained four years holding a teaching position in Borch's College. BIIIQ 135, Relative Coaching of Data, point four three. Robert E. Lee, 1807-1870, an American general, BIIQ 130, BIIIQ 130. 1. Family standing. Both of Lee's parents belonged to colonial families of high standing. The father, a member of an ancient family of Norman descent, and at one time governor of Virginia, is said to have been a more impetuous spirit than his son. The mother, who was for many years an invalid, taught Robert through her own example an important lesson in self-denial, self-control, and economy. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Horses were always a delight to Robert, and as a boy he followed the hunt for hours without fatigue. 2. Education. In order that the children might be educated, the family moved to Alexandria, and Lee's first attendance at school was at the academy of that city. 3. School standing and progress. At school, Robert was attentive, diligent, methodical, and correct in deportment. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. After the death of his father, which occurred when he was 11, the boy served as housekeeper and nurse for his invalid mother, riding out with her in the carriage and doing the marketing for the family. 7. Evidences of Precocity Both of his elder brothers were very clever and possibly overshadowed Robert, but the striking qualities of his character were early observable. Before he was eleven, his father wrote of him that he was always good. At the age of eleven, when his father died, he was old beyond his years and of a thoughtfulness, a sense of filial obligation and a warm affection for his parents that aided him to accept responsibilities of which a few boys of his age would have been capable. As a lad of fifteen or sixteen, he was considered by relatives a youth of great promise. See also 2.6. BIIQ 130, relative coach data, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17 and 18, Lee was an exemplary student at Mr. Hallowell's school, preparatory to entering West Point. His speciality was finishing up. At West Point, age 18 to 22, Lee received not one demerit mark and graduated second in a class of 46. Immediately afterward, he received an appointment as a second lieutenant of engineers in the seacoast defence. His marriage at 24 was a culmination of a romance which dated from his cadet days. BIIIQ 130, Relative Coast of Data, point five three. David Livingstone, 1813-1873, a celebrated African explorer and missionary. BIIQ 135, BIIIQ 140. One family standing. 
Among the paternal ancestors of the Livingstone family, there was said to have been, for six generations, not a dishonest man, nor ever a Livingstone who was a donkey. The father served an apprenticeship to a tailor and married the tailor's daughter, but eventually became a small tea dealer. He served for twenty years as deacon in the independent church. The mother, a delicate woman with a flow of good spirits, did her best to make two ends meet. The Livingstone home was marked by honesty, thrift, self-restraint, love of books, and the fear of God. 2. Development Word 17 1. Interests Livingstone's interest in study was intense. C. 2. 3. His reading apparently stimulated him to scour the countryside in holidays collecting samples mentioned in Culpepper's Herbal. Before he was ten, he had begun to collect flowers and shells, and he liked sports, especially swimming and fishing. 2. Education While employed in a cotton factory, Livingstone, aged ten or more, studied Latin at the factory evening school. 3. School standing in progress Even at the factory, where the workday lasted from 6am to 8pm, he would study while he worked, placing his book on the spinning jenny in front of him, and at home he would continue reading until midnight if his mother did not interfere. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading During the factory period, aged 10 to 19, Livingstone read everything he could get hold of except novels, which were banned by his father. He bought Ruddyman's Rudiments of Latin out of his first week's wages. He learned to know Virgil and Horace well. Scientific books and books of travel were a special delight, but dry doctrinal reading were distasteful. The boy was whipped by his father for refusing to read Wilberforce's Practical Christianity. He disliked all religious reading until in his latter teens he found, from Dick's Philosophy of Religion and the Philosophy of Our Future State, that religion and science were not hostile. 6. Production and Achievement Before he was ten years old, Livingstone had won twofold distinction. He had carried off the prize for repeating the whole of the 119th Psalm with only five hitches, and he had carved his name in the ruins of both Bothwell Castle at a higher point than any other boy. It is reported that he would scrub for his mother if the public were barred from seeing him at so feminine a task. Livingstone's work in the factory as piercer began in his eleventh year. In holidays from his occupation, he collected wildflowers, carboniferous shells, and fossils, and his own observation led him to question the explanation that when God made the rocks, he made the shells in them. 7. Evidences of Precocity At the age of twelve, David began to reflect on his state of a sinner, but he could not, at that time, reconcile religion and science. It's also 2, 3, 5, and 6. BIIQ 135, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Before the age of 19, Livingstone's missionary interest was aroused by the formation of a missionary society in Plantadier, and at this time he determined to become a medical missionary in China. Promoted in the factory at 19 from piercing to cotton spinning, he was soon well enough paid to permit his attendance at medical and Greek classes in the winter and divinity lectures in the summer. At 22, he attended also an evening class in chemistry, to which he walked eight miles after the day's work. At 25, he was accepted for service by the London Missionary Society, a non-sectarian organisation, and was sent for three months probationary training to a clerical tutor. BIIQ 140, Relative Coastal Data, 0.43 Hugh Miller, 1802-1856, Scottish geologist and writer. BIIQ 135, BIIQ 130. 1. Family standing. Miller's father, descended from a long line of seafaring Scandinavians, had first put to sea at seven or eight years of age, and at thirty, owned his own sloop. He was the sturdiest among five hundred able bodied seamen, and was possessed of humour and a soft and genial nature. The mother, simple, confiding, and affectionate, was much younger than her husband. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. During his school day, Hugh cared little for boyish amusements. He preferred to spend his time wandering over pebble beds, learning to distinguish their various components, and so fond was he of his pastime that he played truant from school to indulge in it. He learned from an uncle to observe fish and sea animals. Alone in play, he carried out mock military tactics on the sand with different coloured shells for the various troops. 
During school vacations, he was the leader of a gang of boys and enjoyed exploring caves, living in wild places, and performing such pranks as apple stealing. 2. Education At the age of four or five, Hugh learned to read at a dame school. Later, and until he was fourteen years old, he attended the grammar school of the parish Cromarty. From fourteen to sixteen, he was enrolled in a subscription school. 3. School standing and progress Under the guidance of an old dame, Hugh spelled his way through the shorter catechisms, the Proverbs, and the New Testament. At the parish grammar school and on recommendation of his master, he was transferred from the English to the Latin form because he always substituted a synonym for a word missed in any of his English tasks. In rudiments, he was usually behind his schoolfellows, who were by no means bright, because he found the formal studies dull, but he excelled in translation because he could remember word for word the translation which the master gave when he assigned the lesson. At sixteen, having quarrelled with the master over the spelling of a word, he left school never to return. 4. Friends and Associates Only one friend, a boy younger than himself, would join Hugh in his earliest natural history excursions, but later an adventurous gang followed the young naturalist and recognised him as their leader. 5. Reading Hugh learned at Dame's school that the art of reading was the art of finding stories and books. He spent out-of-school hours reading Bible stories. He collected a library of such books as Jack the Giant Killer, Sinbad the Sailor, Aladdin, from his 6th to his 11th year, his reading included Pope's translation of the Odyssey and the Iliad, Pilgrim's Progress, Robinson Crusoe, Gulliver's Travels, Ambrose on Angels, a rare copy of The Miracles of Nature and Art, and accounts of the voyages of Anson, Drake, Rayleigh, Dampier, and Captain Woods Rogers. At ten years of age, his patriotism was stirred by blind Harry's Wallace. Between the ages of six and sixteen, the boy used to read In School, For Pleasure, Dryden's Virgil and Ovid. An old book collector allowed the boy to read his volumes of the British essays from Addison to Mackenzie, books of travel and translation from the German of Levetier, Zimmermann, and Klopstock. Sometime during his early teens, he began to read theological discussions. 6. Production and Achievement When he was not more than ten years of age, his schoolmaster commended the sense of a poem of care, which he found in the boy's copy book, although he criticised the spelling, grammar, and punctuation. During his early grammar school years, the boy, aged six to twelve, used to relate to his schoolmates all the stories he had read, in addition to new ones of his own invention, of warriors, voyagers, and dwellers on desolate islands. Before he left the grammar school, he had made his first studies of earth and nature. It is reported that he discovered garnets on the shore by noting their resemblance to his mother's brooch, that he learned by observation to understand some of the simpler instincts of insects and that he discovered in an old cave some bones of animals from another age. He also constructed a miniature boat after the plan of a print he had seen in a book. At ten or twelve, he wrote in verse an account of his experience when trapped in a sea cave, winning praise from the townsfolk for his production. A little later, he was filling his copy books with verses and original prose. He is said to have edited a little paper, The Village Observer, during this period. On long tours with his cousin about the countryside, he would tell stories ten, fifteen, or thirteen miles long, according to the length of the journey. At the age of 16, he constructed an ingenious path to an otherwise inaccessible rock, winning the esteem of an old soldier of Wellington's army by his device. 7. Evidences of Precocity Out of before the age of five, Hugh had already acquired a knowledge of letters by studying trade signs where various articles were pictured and named. BIIQ 135, relative quotient of data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At seventeen, resisting the offers of two uncles, who volunteered to support him if he would go to college, Miller apprenticed himself for three years to a mason, the husband of his aunt. During the period of his apprenticeship, he collected geological specimens, and in the evenings and on long holidays, studied and recorded his philosophic and poetic musings. From the age of twenty to twenty-three, he was a journeyman mason, and from twenty-two to twenty-three, a stone cutter, keeping up in the meantime both his reading and his writing. Poems written during this period were later published. BIIIQ 130, relative kosher of data 0.53. Leon Gambetta, 1838 to 1882, a French statesman. BIIQ 140, BIIIQ 140. 1. Family standing. Gambetta's paternal ancestors had followed the sea. Although Leon's father, a man of ready tongue, was respected for his honesty and integrity, he did not strike his neighbours as either very intelligent or very prudent. 
The mother, daughter of a chemist, is said to have had a charming and affectionate disposition. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. At the age of 12, Leon had decided to become a sailor. He met his father's objection to this plan by saying, We die only when we have to. After all, one may escape the greatest dangers only to perish by some apparently trifling cause. The first demonstration of the boy's staunch republicanism occurred when, at the age of 11, he joined in burning Louis Napoleon in effigy, an exploit for which he was nearly expelled from school. 2. Education At four years of age, Gambetta first attended school, and there he learned to read. The years from 9 to 14 were spent attending the seminary of Montfaucon, the succeeding four years at the Lycée of Cahors. 3. School standing and progress the boy's recitations, improvisations, and harangues to his schoolfellows at the seminary promised well for the future politician. His letters were those of an affectionate child, but a mediocre scholar. However, his first schoolmaster said that at ten years of age, he was more intelligent than most boys of that age, so he was able, though giving less time to his studies, to do more than his schoolfellows. He excelled in history, Latin, and composition. The same master also referred to his pupil's keen, quick, and observant mind. Although little Gambetta was careless of his appearance, and of his exercises, which were often dirty and untidy, nevertheless he won in the eighth form, at the age of nine or ten, a first prize for reading and a mention of history. Improving in the seventh form at ten or eleven, he won prizes in history, geography and reading, and the highest mention for Latin, composition, history, geography and writing. In his twelfth year, an accident which occasioned the loss of an eye was a cause of a delay in his school progress. By the age of 12, he began to rank first or second in Latin in a class of 26, and at 14, he received first prizes in ancient history and Latin version, an honourable mention of a Greek and Latin themes, grammar and geography. The headmaster of La Cie reported when Gambetta was 15, he had a great deal of aptitude. He is a good boy, but too thoughtless. He does not make as much progress as he ought to. At 16 or 17, he was told by his tutor that he had exceptional talents particularly for oratory. Four friends and associates, no record. Five reading, no record. Six production and achievement, no record. Seven evidences of precocity. A note written by Gambetta at the age of ten to his father concludes with the republican cry, Long live Kavagnac, down with Bonaparte. The young enthusiast early expressed the opinion that Napoleon was as stupid as an ostrich. See also 2-1. BIIQ 140, relative quotient of data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After finishing his college course, in which he had done good work in the classical languages, history, and cosmography, he had won several prizes. Gambetta, at 18, travelled for a time with his father in Italy, and then began the study of law in Paris. During the period of study, he contributed articles to a liberal journal. At 22, he passed his law examinations brilliantly, and in the following year, was practicing law with noteworthy success. At 25, he was appointed a member of the Republican Committee to draw up the list of legislative candidates. BIIIQ 140, relative coastal data 0.60. Nathaniel Hawthorne, 1804 to 1864, an American novelist. BIIQ 140, BIIIQ 135. 1. Family Standing. Hawthorne was descended from English colonial stock. His father, a sea captain, was a silent, reserved, stern, melancholy man who carried his books to sea. He was fond of children. The mother was beautiful and ascetic in the human rather than in the religious way. She is said to have fine traits of intellect and character. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Hawthorne wrote, One of the peculiarities of my boyhood was a grievous disinclination to go to school. As a very young child, Nathaniel had a strong desire to follow his father to sea. A little later, his tastes were for the most part of a quieter sort. He was extremely fond of animals, and during a prolonged period of lameness, he amused himself by knitting a pair of socks for the household cat, and by constructing houses of books for her. Still, he was also a good deal of a sportsman, as to fishing and hunting. And when the family moved to Maine, he ran quite wild, learning in the main woods his cursed habit of solitude. In winter, he would skate alone until midnight. At sixteen, the youth suffered some indecision as to going to college, but finally, because of his thought of becoming an author, he became reconciled to the idea. 2. Education 
Hawthorne went to school half as much as other boys, partially owing to delicate health, and partially because, much of his time, there were no schools within reach. He carried on his primary studies with a tutor, and also attended dancing school. From 13 to 15, he had irregular schooling with a somewhat eccentric graduate of Harvard. At 15, he attended school in Salem to prepare for college, and at 16, he studied with a lawyer. 3. School Standing and Progress No record except of his dislike for school, C21. 4. Friends and Associates None of his associates are mentioned other than relatives, including especially his sister. With her, he carried on an intimate correspondence when she was absent from home. 5. Reading When he was six years old, Hawthorne's favourite book was Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which he would read by the hour without once speaking. During his period of lameness, aged 9 to 12, he would read all day long, especially Shakespeare, Pilgrim's Progress, and any poetry within reach. He also made himself familiar with Spencer's Fairy Queen, Frosite's Chronicles, and Clarendon's History of the Rebellion, Milton, Pope's Iliad, and The Spectator. Stern comments that it is somewhat exceptional for a child of ten to enjoy the Fairy Queen. Hawthorne was the exceptional child, and this book was the first that he bought with his own money. At fifteen, he was reading Waverley and other romances. At sixteen, he had read all of Scott's novels, then published except The Abbot. 6. Production and Achievement During the years of his lameness, Nathaniel sometimes invented extemporaneous stories, and these invariably commenced with a voyage to some foreign country. A letter to his uncle is preserved, written at the age of nine, in which he discusses in a childlike but intelligent fashion his lameness and the prospects for his recovery. At twelve and a half he composed a poem, and this was followed, before the age of seventeen, by a number of other literary productions. He is said also to have kept a diary in his early teens. At sixteen he earned some money by writing in the office of an uncle. At the same age, he put out five successive issues of The Spectator, a weekly journal printed with pen on small note paper. His contributions show a dry humour and mastery of the art of presenting true fiction. 7. Evidences of Precocity At five, Nathaniel was a vivacious, golden-haired boy, running and dancing at play. When he could scarcely speak plainly, he would go about the house, repeating the vehement emphasis certain stagey lines from Shakespeare's Richard III, which he had overheard from older persons about him. In boyhood, he already displayed a tendency toward dry humour. It is related how he gave an excuse for frequent fights with John Knights, that John Knights is a boy with a very quarrelsome disposition. See also 2, 5, and 6. BIIQ 140, relative question of data, 0.75. 3. Development from 17 and 26. Hawthorne entered Baldoyne College at 17, and during the next four years, he did commemorable work in Latin and English composition, though he was slow in mathematics and metaphysics. In spite of the fact that he was, according to his latter admission, an idle student, negligent of college rules, he assimilated the knowledge that he cared for with great ease. While at college, he determined to become an author, and he wrote several tales, unpublished before Forshaw appeared. The letter was published by the author, then in his 25th year, at his own expense. BIIQ 135, Relative Question of Data, 0. 0.60 End of section 37section 38 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 24. Case Studies of Group B. Part 2. Harriet Marchenau, 1802-1876, an English novelist and writer. BIIQ 140, BIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Harriet Mottenau's great-great-grandfather was a Huguenot refugee, a surgeon. Her father, a simple, upright, self-denying and affectionate man, was the youngest son of a large family. Endowed with natural shrewdness, he overcame the drawbacks of an inadequate education and became a successful manufacturer and merchant. Her mother, daughter of a sugar refiner, did not understand her daughter in youth, but later encouraged her literary ambitions. 2. Development to age 17 one interests. As a child, Harriet was very unhappy, 
living under an unacceptable terror of both persons and things. Her mental instability showed itself in exhibitions of excessive shyness, in a plan, formulated age seven, to commit suicide in order to reach heaven at once, and in an outburst of religious fanaticism which occurred in her seventeenth year under the influence of a Unitarian minister. Certain religious interests were probably natural developments in her surroundings. At an early age, she formed the habit of writing out on Sunday evening the sermon heard earlier in the day. When quite a small child, the Bible and especially the New Testament attracted her strongly. At seven, she memorized the whole of Paradise Lost in a few months. Her interest in reading was not limited to religious works, and at fifteen, she became a sort of walking concordance of Shakespeare as well as of Milton. 2. Education Harriet sometimes asked strangers for a maxim, which, when granted, she wrote out even when her small fingers could scarcely join the letters. At the age of five, she was taught to sew by a nurse who thought her dull, unobservant, slow and awkward. Shyness and fear made the child often appear a very dull pupil in music and other subjects, but she could execute all her musical tasks if she thought no one was listening. Until eleven years of age, she was taught at home by the older brothers and a sister according to a course of study which included Latin, French, writing, and arithmetic. Later, she studied Cicero, Virgil, Horace, and French grammar in the school of Mr. Perry, Unitarian minister. From thirteen to fifteen, she had lessons at home in Latin, French, and music. In her sixteenth year, she went to live with her aunt in Bristol, and there engaged in private study of analytical books and logic and rhetoric, history and poetry. 3. School standing and progress. Harriet learned by heart easily, but she was indolent in body, and lazy about using the dictionary. At Mr. Perry's school, she got into the habit of thinking in Latin, and she attained a considerable skill in versification. The master said he never had a fault to find with her. 4. Friends and Associates. No specific record. Deafness which had developed by the time she was twelve. General ill health. Fear of people which continued until she was nearly sixteen. And shyness, where all hindrances to normal social relationships. 5. Reading. At the age of seven, Harriet kept Paradise Lost constantly with her. She studied the New Testament carefully. At home she read aloud a good deal of history, biography, and critical literature. 6. Production Achievement, C2-1. 7. Evidence of Precocity, C2-1. BIIQ 140, Relative Quotient of Data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Harriet continued her studies after returning home from Bristol, adding philosophy to the list of subjects included in the course. She translated Petrarch into English sonnets of the same form and made a credible rendering from Tacitus. She thought out for herself the necessary and solution of the foreknowledge of God, and afterward read all she could find on the subject. At nineteen, her female writer's practical divinity appeared in the Unitarian monthly repository, and two years later her devotional exercises were published. She wrote some poetry and a few tales illustrating social and economic conditions. Principle and Practice and My Servant Rachel belonged to her twenty-fifth year. She was twice in love and the second time became engaged, but before the marriage her lover had died insane. BIIQ 140, Relative Coach of Data, 0 0.60 Hans Christian Orsted, 1777 to 1851, a Danish physicist, discoverer of electromagnetism. BIIQ 140, BIIIQ 160. 1. Family Standing. Orsted's father was a village apothecary. No record has been found of the mother or her family. 2. Development towards 17. 1. Interests. At the age of 12, Orrester determined to devote himself to the study of theology, but his interest was not limited to this subject alone, for he had a decided taste for poetry and a bent for scientific investigation, especially in the field of pharmacology. 2. Education Between his 8th and 13th year, Orrester was sent by his father regularly each day to a wigmaker's, where he was taught by the wife to read properly in Danish, while the wigmaker instructed him in German and arithmetic. The boy made rapid progress. Afterward, in his spare time, Orsted received instruction in Greek and Latin from a student. 3. School standing and progress. Orsted was largely self-taught, and he was successful in acquiring the elements in which it was said that he was not slow. An old arithmetic which he found, he studied carefully. At the age of 12, he began to learn French. 
four friends and associates. Hans Christian and his younger brother, Anders Sondo Orsted, later distinguished as philosopher and jurist, were close associates both in childhood and later. Five reading, no further record. Six production achievement. Beginning at the age of 12, Orsted labored zealously as apprentice in the paternal pharmaceutical laboratory. He was deeply interested in foreign languages and possessed considerable ability in their acquisition. He endeavored to learn French by himself, and during the period from his 13th to his 18th year, he translated several odes of Horace and a part of the Henriade into Danish. 7. Evidences of Precocity Hans Christian often embarrassed those who sought to pull his sagacity to test, so that the gossips of the vicinity used to say of him, He will not live. He has too much smartness. The little lad was able to translate the German Bible into Danish word for word. He possessed an extraordinary memory early remarked by his associates. BIIQ 140, Relative Quotient of Data, 0.53. 3. Development from 17 and 26. At the age of 17, Orsted passed the final examinations of the academy with much honour and entered the university. At 19, he won a prize for his discussion of a literary question, and in the next year, at his university examinations, he astonished his judges by the extent of his knowledge. One of them said to another, What a candidate you have brought us! He knows more than all of us put together. At 21, Orsted obtained a new scholastic prize, and at 22, he obtained the university degree of Doctor of Philosophy upon presentation of a thesis in metaphysics. Before he was 23, Orsted had published several short dissertations on subjects in literature, poetry, and philosophy. He was left at 23 to direct Professor Manthe's pharmacy, and also on one occasion to fill a professor's place in the Academy of Surgery. During the university period, he made important investigations with the recently discovered electric pile, and at 24 pronounced his first law, this being the first step in the career which later brought him eminence. He then started out for an extensive trip through Germany and France, where he was cordially received by leading philosophers and scientists of the day. BIIQ 160, relative coefficient of data, 0 0.60. Charles Sumner, 1811-1874 an American statesman. BIIQ 140, BIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Sumner's father, a Harvard graduate of colonial ancestry, was a well-read and painstaking lawyer, an extremely conscientious man, but for some reason not successful in his profession. However, he held several responsible government positions at different times. The mother, although she had received no more than a common school education, was endowed with good sense and native understanding, such as always to ensure her the respect of the best people. Her forebears were farming people marked by good sense and steady habits. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As a schoolboy, Charles was given to plying travelled persons with many questions. His interests were intellectual rather than social or athletic. He cared little for sports and games, and he soon ceased to attend the dancing school to which his parents sent him. Swimming was the sport he enjoyed most. He always relished fun in a quiet way. 2. Education Sumner commenced his schooling by attendance at about the age of six, at a private infant school kept by his maternal aunt. At ten, he entered a private writing school where he spent a year, learning the elements of the common English branches. Before he was quite eleven, he was admitted with his younger brother to the Boston Latin School, an institution of high reputation with a five-year curriculum including Latin, Greek, mythology, arithmetic, and reading. Sumner was ready to enter Harvard at 15. 3. School standing and progress. At the age of 10, little Charles received a merit card. His interest was not limited to the school subjects, and although his father had not intended him to study the classics, Sumner, on his own initiative, bought from an older boy a Latin grammar and liber primus studied them privately, and soon surprised his father by his ability to recite them. Although he was not always attentive to his studies at school, the other boys felt the superiority of his mind and education, because he knew so much outside of the prescribed curriculum. The teacher could not catch him on a point in geography, although this was not a regular school subject. At the closing exercises of the Latin school, Sumner, aged 15, took part with another youth in a debate entitled A Discussion on the Comparative Merits of the Present Age and the Age of Chivalry, and he was one of six scholars to be awarded a Franklin Medal. 4. Friends and Associates 
No specific record has been found of Sumner's early associates other than members of the family. In his sophomore year at college, began his friendship with John W. Brown, who, in his opinion, gave in college the largest promise of future eminence. The chum of his freshman year was Jonathan Steers, who took high rank in college and later became a clergyman. 5. Reading Sumner was always fond of reading. He enjoyed historical works especially, reading them with earnest attention. At 14, he was reading Gibbon and copying extracts which pleased him. 6. Production and Achievement At the age of 13, Sumner won a third prize for a translation from Ovid and a second prize for a translation from Sallust. At 14, he wrote a compendium of English history from Caesar's conquest in 1801, events succinctly narrated in good English, with their dates, a work that filled a manuscript book of 86 pages. Pierce believes that the elder Sumner may have suggested undertaking this work. Charles engaged in the usual Latin verse writing, and some of his efforts indicate considerable skill. At 15, he won second prizes for a Latin hexameter poem, and for an English theme. 7. Evidences of Precocity He was remembered from his school days as large for his age, amiable and quiet, and maturer than most of the other scholars. BIIQ 140, Relative Question Data, 0.60 3. Development from 17 to 26 At college, Sumner was one of the best classical scholars. He excelled in translations and forensics, but he failed entirely in mathematics. At the age of 18, he published in a newspaper an essay on English universities, and between 19 and 22, he won three prizes for essays on social and economic subjects. A year later, graduating from college, he entered the Harvard Law School, remaining there for two years. Admitted to the bar at 23, he had immediately engaged in law practice. By the age of 26, he had acted as instructor in the Harvard Law School. He also contributed to legal journals and edited legal reports. BIIIQ 145, Relative Coast of Data, 0 0.60. George Eliot, Mary Ann Evans. 1819 to 1880, a celebrated English novelist. BIIQ 150, BIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing Mary Ann Evans' father, by training a carpenter, became a forester, land agent and surveyor to five estates. He possessed great vigour both of mind and body, and a character of the highest integrity, and was a good churchman and a staunch Tory. The mother, a shrewd and practical woman of a rather better social position than her husband, was endowed with a warm heart and an unusual amount of natural force. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Mary Ann was so devoted to her brother, three years her senior, that she insisted on following him in every childish undertaking. But she liked best to live in a world of her own creation, imagining scenes in which she was the chief actor. Books early became a passion, and her appetite for reading was insatiable. Her enthusiasm and sentiment for music was strongly marked, and her music master's son confessed he had no more to teach her. At school, she was frequently called upon to play for visitors. 2. Education Marianne was sent to school unusually early because of her mother's poor health. She attended a school nearby and part of each day for two years. From the age of five until she was 15, she attended a series of boarding schools. At the first, the little girl, far from home, was subject to night fears. She is said to have been otherwise quite happy. At the second boarding school, her religious sensibility was developed by acquaintance with the governess, who became a devoted friend. At the third, her English style was trained, and she gained much in precision. When barely 16, she was taken out of school because of her mother's fatal illness. 3. School standing and progress. Mary Ann had some difficulty in learning to read, not because she was slow, but because she liked to play so much better. At her first boarding school, she was observed and serious beyond her years, and observant. She developed a habit of sitting in corners watching her elders. She early showed early mastery of the usual school learning. At her last boarding school, she was recognised as one of the most promising pupils, being greatly in advance of her fellows in her knowledge of French and in English composition. She was a leader of prayer meetings amongst the girls and of charitable enterprises. 4. Friends and Associates Miss Lewis, the principal governess of one of her schools, and an ardent evangelical churchwoman, was for many years her only intimate friend and correspondent. Mary Ann did not associate freely with children of her own age. 5. Reading 
The first book she read was The Linnet's Life, and when still very young she took a passionate delight in Aesop's fables. By the time she was seven or eight she read every volume available, among others the works of Scott, who from her first acquaintance with Waverley became a great favourite. Other favourites were The History of the Devil by Daniel Defoe, Pilgrim's Progress, and Rasselas. In her thirteenth year she came upon Bulwer's Devereux, and was considerably shaken by the impression that religion was not requisite to moral excellence. 6. Production and Achievement With no more than eight years of age, Marianne wrote out from memory the story of Waverley. Before she was twelve, she and her brother used to act charades for the family audience, and at this time Marianne began to be regarded as a child beyond the ordinary. In her fourteenth year, she received a school prize, a copy of Pascal. 7. Evidence of the Precocity. No additional record. C26. BIIQ 150, relative quotient of data 0 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. After her sister's marriage, Mary Ann became an exemplary housewife for her father. She took regular lessons from Mr. Bezzi in music, French, Italian, and German, besides doing a large amount of miscellaneous reading, especially in the field of religion. After moving from the farm to a house near Coventry, she found in two new friends and their associates an intellectual stimulus hitherto lacking in her life. Mr. Bray, a wealthy manufacturer, and his wife were believers in phrenology, interested in philosophical speculations and in problems of religion and theology. At the Bray's, Miss Evans met Emerson, Froude, Robert Owens, George Combe, and other men of mark. In this stimulating society, she soon changed her attitude toward the old religious dogmas and determined, in order to be quite consistent, to give up going to church. At this time, she took lessons in Greek and studied Hebrew by herself. At 24, she began a translation of Strauss's Life of Jesus, which was published three years later. BIIIQ 150, relative coach to data 0.75. Charlotte Bront, 1816-1815 an English novelist. BIIQ 155, BIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing. Charlotte's father was an Irishman of peasant stock, who, after having been a weaver and schoolmaster in Ireland, put himself through Cambridge and became a clergyman of the Church of England. Some volumes of his verse and a few open letters were published. This clever man was a victim of hypochondria, and his character was marked equally by vehement prejudice and keen intelligence. His wife, Maria Branwell, came of a nonconformist Cornish family of good descent. She was intelligent, read with discrimination, and wrote an essay on the advantage of poverty in religious concerns. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. In early years, Charlotte manifested a keen interest in politics. The Duke of Wellington, at that time Prime Minister and leader of the Tory party, was long her special idol. She was greatly interested in art and developed some talent in drawing, although in the main her interests were studious and literary. 2. Education The Reverend Mr. Bront, probably influenced by Rousseau's theories of education, sought to make his children hardly and indifferent to the pleasures of food and dress. A regular lesson schedule was followed under the father's instruction, but the children were in the habit of picking up an immense amount of miscellaneous information for themselves. At the age of eight, Charlotte was sent to a school for clergyman's daughters. From nine to thirteen, she was at home. At fourteen, she was sent to Rowhead Head School, where she remained a year and a half, after which she again returned home. 3. School standing and progress. At her first school, Charlotte was a general favourite. Never under disgrace, however slight. At Rowhead School, although handicapped at her entrance by the regularity of her earlier studies, she quickly rose to the first place in the first class. She is described by a school friend as having been head of the school in all intellectual pursuits. At the close of the first half year, Charlotte won three prizes and a silver medal for fulfilment of duties. She retained to the end of her school course. Her only school fine was that for late talk. Friends and Associates United to her sisters by common intellectual interests and ambitions, Charlotte found in them her closest friends. At Rowhead School, she formed two lifelong friendships with two schoolmates, Ellen Nussie and Mary Taylor. The latter seems to have been an unusually intelligent young woman. 5. Reading All the Bronts read omnivorously. 
of irregularity from earliest childhood the imitation of christ and scott's tales of a grandfather are two books specifically mentioned as having been read by charlotte before she was fifteen as evidence of the extent of her reading the following may be quoted soon after leaving school at sixteen she admitted reading something of cobet's she did not like him she said but all was fish that came to her net six production and achievement all four of the little bronts commenced to write at a very early age the history of the year eighteen twenty nine a detailed account of family and intellectual activities was written by charlotte before she was thirteen her catalogue of my books was the period of their completion up to august third eighteen thirty includes twenty two volumes all written within a period of fifteen months each volume contains from sixty to one hundred pages and the series includes adventure tales books of rhymes a drama in two volumes six numbers of a magazine etc an adventure in ireland written when the author was thirteen has been considered to exhibit distinct foreshadowings of charlotte's peculiar talent a list of painters whose works i wish to see indicates at thirteen keen interest in art and a wide and unusual acquaintance with its history on the part of one who had no first-hand acquaintance with pictures a poem the wonderful stags written before she was seventeen exact date unknown certainly shows correct versification and a high degree of imaginative sensitiveness while at Head school charlotte enjoyed an ability to frighten her friends by her imaginative stories seven evidences of precocity as soon as they could read and write charlotte and her brother and sisters invented and acted little plays of their own the following instance reported at about seven being asked by her father to name the best book in the world charlotte answered the bible and the next best the book of nature after her entrance at the first school she was described thus in the official register writes indifferently ciphers a little and works neatly knows nothing of grammar geography history or accomplishments although of her age but knows nothing systematically but see two four six and seven B I I Q one hundred and fifty five letter of caution update at point eight two three development from seventeen to twenty six from the age of sixteen charlotte bront spent three years at home assisting in the education of her young sisters and devoting her leisure hours to reading and writing she read at this time the english classical writers biographical works and works on natural history she also maintained an interest in politics at the age of nineteen charlotte became a teacher at Rowhead school here she stayed for three happy years until her health failed and she was forced to return home to recuperate at twenty-three she entered upon a position as governess and took another at twenty-five at twenty-three she declined two offers of marriage throughout the years her health was almost constantly poor and her salary when she was teaching meagre b i i i q one hundred fifty five relief coastal data point eight two john henry newman 1801 to 1890 an english theologian b i i q 155 b i i i q 155 one family standing newman's father a banker came from a family of landed propertyers originally of dutch extraction and his mother from a french protestant family descended from henry fordronier said to have been an admiral of france the older newman who was reported to have been very intellectual had also a taste for music which he encouraged in his children the mother inherited the family tradition in religion two development to age seventeen one interests see also two five six and seven newman was studious devoted to literary exercises and to books he showed some musical talent and at the age of ten he began to learn to play upon the violin he was superstitious and imaginative he often used to wish that the Arabian Nights were true. At fifteen, he is described as a dreamy boy with a mind biased in the direction of religion. His conversion occurred at this time. Although he was never, or was scarcely ever, seen taking part in any game, yet he was often chosen by the other boys as arbitrator in their disputes. 2. Education From his eighth to his fifteenth year, Newman attended a school at Ealing, near London, under the Reverend George Nicholas dcl of oxford at nine he studied ovid and greek at ten he began verses at eleven he got into diatessaron and homer and at twelve herodotus during his school years he was taught music by a private master 
He entered Trinity College, Oxford, just before the age of 16. 3. School study and progress. Dr. Nicholas said that no boy had run through the school, from the bottom to the top, as rapidly as John Newman. From Oxford, which the boy entered two years below the usual age, he wrote to his father, I now see the disadvantage of going too soon to Oxford, for there are several who know more than I do in Latin and Greek, and I do not like that. In spite of his youth, Newman was so proficient in mathematics that he surprised his tutor, and he had to fag hard to keep up with his friend Bowen. At 16, Newman won a commendation for his Latin declamations. 4. Friends and Associates Although bored by general society, John was devoted to his mother and sisters. During his first year of college, aged 15 and 16, he formed a lasting friendship with a fellow freshman, John William Belden, three years his senior. 5. Reading Newman was brought up from his earliest years to take a great delight in reading the Bible. He recollected listening to the reading of the Lay of the Last Minstrel when he was about eight, and during his boyhood he used to read Scott's novels in the early summer mornings in bed. At fourteen he read Payne's tracts against the Old Testament, finding pleasure in thinking of the objections which were contained in them. At fifteen he read some of Hume's essays, Pope's essay on man, and such works as Newton's dissertation on the prophecies and Milner's church history, and was enamoured of the church fathers. Under his mother's influence, he read the works of the Protestant divines. He loved to read serious books aloud to the servants, expounding their meaning. As a college youth of sixteen, he was very fond of Bishop Beveridge's private thoughts. 6. Production and Achievement At nine, Newman kept a pocket diary in which he read these entries among others. Heard for the first time the cuckoo, dreamed that Mary was dead, etc., etc., and also a number of verses and moral axioms. At eleven, Newman began some original expositions in prose and verse, and it is recorded that, at this time, he wrote a mock drama of some kind. By fourteen, he was possessed by a passion for writing. He wrote a burlesque opera, composing tunes for the songs. He maintained two opposing controversial periodicals, The Spy and the Anti-Spy. Thirty numbers of one and twenty-seven of the other appeared within six months, but with scant sympathy for his early production, he wrote letter. There is not a sentence in either worth preserving. Between 14 and 15, he contributed to the portfolio written by a club of senior boys nicknamed the Spy Club. And in 15, he wrote some reflections on the subject of recreations as the beginning of sins. At 15 or 16, the beholder, all of his own writing, ran through 40 numbers and 160 octavo pages closely written. Of this periodical, he wrote letter, It is far superior in composition to my others, but nothing worth keeping but some verses, to the doctrine of which I now hold fast. At this time he made a speech before the Duke of Kent, who said, The action was so good. It is reported further that he took part in school performances of Terence's plays. At sixteen, Newman composed an essay on fame, in which he expressed the idea that it is the name and not the person which is celebrated. He prepared the texts of some dozen sermons, buzzing at the same time over such questions as predestination and aphasious grace. 7. Evidences of Precocity In early boyhood, John was a strong-willed child who tried very hard not to yield to his mother. A letter written by his father when the boy was five bids him read it to his mother and to his brother Charles to show how well he can read writing. He continues, but you will observe that you must learn something every day, or you will no longer be called a clever boy. On his sixth birthday, Newman recited Cowper's faithful friend, which he had learned by heart. He was a little later described by his sister as a very philosophical young gentleman, at the age of ten, very observant and considerate. Before fifteen, he was most scrupulous as to facts, correcting a member of the family who spoke of Wellington, who was short of stature, as a gigantic warrior. He was very superstitious. BIIQ 155, relative kosher data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Newman spent his leisure time at college in writing with his friend Bowden. His first poem was published. He read hard, hoping to achieve honours in his final examination. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Newman spent his leisure time at college in writing with his friend Bowden. His first poem was published. He read hard, hoping to achieve honours in his final examination, but being called up a day sooner than he had expected, 
he lost his head and failed to win the converted success. Thereupon he gave up law and decided to enter the ministry, and so remained at Oxford, tutoring private pupils. At 21, he mitigated himself by winning an Oriel Fellowship. At 23, he was ordained a deacon and preached his first sermon. At 24 or 25, he was ordained a priest. Before he was 26, he became a public tutor of Oriel. BIIIQ 155, relative kosher data 0.75. Robert Southey, 1774-1843, an English poet and prose writer. BIIQ 155, BIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing Southey's grandfather and great-grandfather were the yeoman fathers, but his father was a linen draper in Bristol, who failed in business when his son, Robert, was 18. Perhaps it was characteristic of the father that in the evenings he whiled away at the hours over Felix Farley's Bristol Journal, his only reading. Southey's mother was of a sweet temper and happy disposition, and although unschooled, she was able to see her facts swiftly and surely. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As a tiny lad, Robert would beguile the hours in the garden, making friends with flowers and insects. The delight which he early learned to take in rural sights and sounds grew up with him and continued unabated. He had little interest in the usual boyish sports, and many were the truant hours delightfully spent in reading in a friend's library. 2. Education At the age of three, Robert was handed over to the schoolmistress, Ma'am Powell, and at six was advanced to a higher school in Bristol. After a year at boarding school in Corston, he again returned to Bristol, attending from his ninth to his thirteenth year a school whose master was a man of character and certain humorous originality. Thereafter, he was instructed by a Bristol clergyman and by a special tutor. He then entered Westminster School, which he attended till his nineteenth year. 3. School Standing in Progress Southey looked back with pride upon his success in spelling at Corston, but his handwriting in that school was not satisfactory to the severe and stern master. The credit is due to Mr. Williams, master of his fourth school, of having discovered in his favourite pupil a writer of English prose. So great was the teacher's enthusiasm over the pupil's success in writing that Southey's classmates determined to humiliate their more successful colleague. To prove his ignorance, they asked him what the letters I.E. stand for, and he, if ready, promptly answered, For John the Evangelist. At Westminster, Southey collected miscellaneous facts rather than high scholarship reports. 4. Friends and Associates Young Robert spent much of his time, especially in the vacations, with his aunt, Miss Taylor, subject to the humours of a maiden lady of whimsical, irrational and self-indulgent temper. At her house he played with her brother of her maid, more, it is stated, from the need of companionship than from congeniality, and listened to the stories of a feeble old relative. At Westminster he made friends with C.W. Wynne, afterwards Secretary of War and Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, and with G.C. Bitford. 5. Reading Before he was eight, Southey had read Shakespeare, Beaumont and Flilcher, translations of Tasso and Ariosto, and The Fairy Queen. Before he was twelve, he had read Pope's Homer, Michel's Lucide, Sidney's Arcadia, Goldsmith, etc. During the years of Westminster, he read, among other works, Gibbon's Decline and Fall, Picat's religious ceremonies, which impress his imagination strongly, and poems by Crabbe. 6. Production and Achievement Before he was eight, Robert had begun to write a play, and having completed an act and a half, said play writing was the easiest thing in the world. When about eight, assisted by a little friend, he set up a theatre for puppets. At nine, he began to write verses, epics of the Trojan Brutus, Egbert, King Richard III, etc., at twelve and thirteen, he was conscious of the intellectual progress he had derived not from books or instruction, but from constantly exercising himself in English verse. Among his early literary exercises were heroic epistles, translations from Latin poetry, satires, descriptive and moral pieces, a poem of the Trojan War in dialogue, and three books of Cassabellian. At fourteen, he wrote an elegy on the death of his infant sister, Margareta. 7. Evidences of Precocity Robert's emotional sensitiveness made him a mother's darling. When he was two and perhaps before, he wept at the tragic fate of the children sliding on the ice all on a summer's day, or the too early death of Billy Briggle's pig. And so deeply was he moved that he would beg his mother not to proceed with the sad tale. 
At three, he was handed over by his beloved attendant, Patty, to the schoolmistress, who was old and grim. He kicked lustily and cried, Take me to Pat. I don't like ye. You've got ugly eyes. During the two years before he was five, he spent much of his time with his aunt, Miss Tyler. What he most enjoyed doing these visits was to be dressed up and seated beside her in the evening in the best part of the theatre. At the age of seven, it was he who comforted his mother as she wept at the thought of his impending departure for a distant school. BI IQ 155, Relative Quotient Data 0.53 3. Development from 17 to 26 With three Westminster friends, Thalsey started a school paper, The Flagland, in whose pages appeared the essay on flogging, which caused Southey's expulsion from school and prevented his entrance at Christ Church. However he, however, he was accepted to Balliol College, and his expenses there were paid by his uncle, the Reverend Herbert Hill, chaplain in Lisbon. Southey gained little or nothing from the university except a liking for swimming and a knowledge of Epictetus, and perhaps the conviction that Stoicism was the best and noblest of systems. Within six weeks after his nineteenth birthday, he began to finish Joan of Arc, an epic poem in twelve books. At twenty he began to experience difficulty in choosing a profession. In spite of his uncle's wishes, he decided he could not take orders. He tried to become a doctor, but the dissecting room repelled him and he refused a position as a reporter because the paper was opposed to the holding of individual convictions. At this time, Southey met Coleridge, and together the two enthusiasts formed a scheme for a communistic settlement, Pantisocracy in America. After his marriage the next year, Southey abandoned the scheme, thereby causing a breach with Coleridge. At twenty, he lectured on European history, wrote Watt Tyler, part of the fall of Robespierre, and published his first poems. At 21, after a visit to his uncle in Lisbon, he wrote letters from Spain and Portugal. At 23, he made a serious but brief attempt at legal study at Gray's Inn, where he became acquainted with Charles Lamb and Rickman. He was interested at this time in making translations from the German. During this and the next following years, Southey produced more poetry than any other time. He wrote verses for the Morning Post, he edited the first volume of the annual anthology, and the second edition of his Joan of Arc. At 25, after he had recovered from a nervous fever brought on by overwork, he published his second volume of poems. Modoc was finished the same year. BII, IQ 155, relative kosher data 0 0.60. End of section 38, and the end of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. Recorded by Leon Harvey for LibriVox.org.